Good afternoon and welcome back to the Leadership Institute studios. I hope you all had a wonderful new year and are ready for another exciting year of our live webinars. My name is Kyle Bechet. I'm the communications manager here at the Leadership Institute. Our first topic of the new year will be people, parties, and power. Our guest this afternoon is Leadership Institute's founder and president, Morton Blackwell. But before we get into today's topic, I would like to welcome our in-studio audience who will get the chance to ask their questions at the end of today's broadcast, and you at home who will also have the chance to ask questions by emailing us at live at leadershipinstitute.org or by tweeting at us using the hashtag LIWebinar. With that, Morton, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here, Kyle. So Morton, to begin, where do you see political parties and the people within them within today's political process? In my years of political activity, which began in 1960, I found no shortage of conservatives willing to tell political parties what they should do. But I've noticed a great shortage of conservatives willing to take the time, spend the money, and pay the political price necessary to achieve and hold power in a political party. Unless more conservatives accept the responsibility of political participation inside the parties, 30 years from now, conservatives will still be complaining that the parties fail to do what they ought to do. Only a tiny fraction of Americans participate in party activities. There's a great turnover of participants and leadership. In the business world, corporate leadership tends to last for decades. Labor union leadership tends to last for life. Some years ago, I looked up the tenure of all the Republican Party state chairmen in the United States. The average state party chairman had held that post for about 18 months. I believe it is the same thing among Democrats. State law and party rules determine state and local party structure. And no two states are exactly alike in party organization. But in almost every city and county in America, there are many vacancies in official party committees. The same is true in unofficial party structures, including the party's auxiliary organizations. Many, if not most, of the unglamorous jobs in party committees and organizations go begging. In states where local party committees include representatives from each precinct, there are invariably vacancies on the official city and county party committees. Most localities do not have women's Republican clubs or young Republican clubs. Most colleges do not have college Republican clubs. Most high schools do not have teenage Republican clubs or adults willing to serve as advisors to teenage Republican clubs. Most campaigns do not have precinct leaders in every precinct. The same holds true in the Democrat Party. And all party committees, campaign organizations, and auxiliary organizations have jobs left undone because of a lack of volunteers. So Morton, say I'm a newcomer to party politics. What is the right way and the wrong way to get involved? A newcomer who says, I am here to tell you what to do, is viewed with suspicion and even fear. But a newcomer who says, I am here to help you, tell me how I can help, is greeted cordially and usually given things to do. After one election cycle of constructive volunteer activity, the newcomer becomes a veteran and is respected by the old timers. After two or three election cycles, the newcomer has become an old timer. In this context, something President George H.W. Bush said is particularly valuable. He said, 80% of success is just being there. Unfortunately, much of what is said and done in party committee meetings at every level, including even national committee meetings, is uninteresting or even boring. To succeed inside a political party, one must cultivate the ability to sit still and remain polite when foolish people speak nonsense. 
An open structure gives access to the foolish as well as to the wise. Wise people inside a party must cultivate a high level of patience. They must allow for the human frailty in others and strive to appear to suffer most fools gladly. Like many other conservatives, I have come to realize that the time spent sitting through dull parts of meetings is the price one pays to be there, to take part when the really important decisions are made every now and then. So, Morton, when somebody decides to get involved and join their political committee, their, their local chapter, they have to know how to succeed, obviously. What advice do you give them to succeed? A principled conservative who wishes to succeed within a party should heed this list of 10 points. One, make yourself useful to the party's candidates and the activities of party organizations. Choose carefully what you agree to do and then do it well. Two, rise slowly. Don't put yourself forward for every available position of leadership. If you display competence in your party or campaign activities, other people will soon enough be ready to ask you, even urge you, to seek higher posts. Remember, there is always a big turnover. People without persistence drop out. Many vacancies op open up. Even those party activists who have no particular political philosophy still like to win. If you become valuable to the party and a reliable asset to its candidates, even political opportunists will come to tolerate you and your commitment to principles. Three, build a secure home base. It is not necessary that you and your allies now control the local or state party for you to become effective in the long run. What is necessary is that you cultivate allies who will re reliably work together with you for your conservative principles. The Lone Ranger was never a successful politician. Four, don't try to solve all the problems you see in a party committee or in a campaign organization. People resent a know-it-all. Pick and choose the matters in which you become involved. Sometimes it is better to let others learn by their own experience than by your advice. Five, politics is of the heart as well as of the mind. Many people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It is possible often to say unpleasant things pleasantly. Too often our politically wounded are left to bleed to death. Be compassionate and show it. Six, study how to win. Being right in the sense of being correct is not sufficient to win. Political technology determines political success. Learn how to organize and how to communicate. Most political technology is philosophically neutral. You owe it to your philosophy to study how to win. Seven, expand the leadership. Do your best to locate, recruit, train, and place other conservatives in the political process. Attrition of leadership is more severe in party organizations than in almost any other activity. Phyllis Schlafly says, with some justice, that county party chairman is the worst job in politics. Many people burn out quickly. As you build the size of your base of effective activists, it's natural that your own position within the party will gradually improve. Eight, study the rules of procedure. Or find someone of like mind who is or will become expert on the rules. One of the reasons for conservative successes within the Republican Party is that many conservatives in that party have taken the time to master the rules of procedure. Beyond a mastery of rules comes an understanding of meeting dynamics. Meeting dynamics are best learned by long experience at political meetings. 
9. In volunteer politics, a builder can build faster than a destroyer can destroy. If you achieve anything in politics, you will have enemies, some of whom will delight in attacking your every flaw, real or imagined. Do not spend much time replying to such criticism. On the average, it takes less time for you to recruit a new activist than it does for your enemies to persuade one of your recruits that you are a bad person. Over time, you get stronger and your enemies do not. 10. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No candidate is perfect. No party committee is perfect. If you can't cope with anything less than perfection, you will never achieve anything worthwhile. You would be like the pastor who was so concerned with heavenly things that he was no earthly good. Perfection is unattainable on this earth, but it is a useful guide to the direction we should go. One can use a good compass for a lifetime without ever expecting to get to the North Pole. Morton, I think this is some great advice for some conservative activists looking to make a difference and, um, and get involved. Now, with all this advice, wh what is the importance of these political parties, and why is it important for conservatives to get involved with them? Kyle, the United States um, has political parties, but a political party is not easily defined. Power is more diffuse in American political parties than in government. After all, it is possible for government to make a decision binding on everyone. There is no mechanism for doing that in our political parties. Each party committee is a separate opportunity for conservative activists. The giant senatorial and congressional party committees of both major parties are entirely independent of the Republican and Democratic National Committees, which themselves are creations of the state parties and their national conventions. A party national committee has almost no supervisory role over the state parties, which in turn dare not interfere much in the local party organizations. Party committees exist independently. Taken together, they raise and spend hundreds of millions of dollars, and each can have a major role in the selection of candidates at a specific level of government. Major party fundraising is much easier than other political fundraising. It's like having a license, a limited license, to print money. A party has meaning only to the extent that people's actions give it meaning. It's a vehicle for political action. As leaders of the conservative movement realize, parties alone are not sufficient to preserve our hard-won freedoms. Candidates, once nominated, run their own campaigns, sometimes with and sometimes without much help from party committees and support of various types from many, many non-party organizations is required for victory. But while parties are not sufficient, they are necessary. If conservatives fail to engage in party activities, then party committees at every level will be run by people who do not share conservative views, that is, by opportunists and liberals. Conservatives should never lose sight of the difference between power and influence. Power is the ability to make things happen. Influence is the ability to have one's views at least taken into account by those who have power. To people motivated by political philosophy, influence is not enough. Just as conservatives should work to get fellow conservatives into positions of governmental power, they have an obligation to be active themselves in the party structures. There is too much power there for it to be abandoned. 
Conservative organizations have many millions of members and supporters who, if led by their leadership, would be interested in participating in party activity. Morton, I think we've, this has been a great discussion so far, and I, uh, we're having, uh, I think we're learning a lot today. Um, as we move to more of the question part of this, uh, we have a couple of more um, things to talk about, you and I. But I'd like to remind all of our viewers at home that you can send in your questions by emailing us at live at leadershipinstitute.org. And then once, uh, we'll, once during the, throughout the broadcast, we'll have the opportunity to answer those questions. Um, but back to uh, more of the topic. Uh, that we're talking right about right now is, uh, so I'm a strong, I'm a conservative with strong principles, but I don't have the time or the energy to sit through some of these meetings um, for one reason or another. What should I be doing as a committed conservative, helping, uh, you know, helping others win? Conservatives who absolutely, positively, cannot sit through long, tedious political party meetings have an obligation to find and support financially fellow conservatives with cast iron behinds, people willing and able to do the partisan jobs which must be done. As few as 50,000 conservatives newly determined to become party activists could in four years or less make a national party as reliably conservative as the Democrat Party is today reliably liberal. With, it, with this influx of new participants, that party would elect a lot of its candidates. Great. Well, Morton, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we uh, come to the end of our discussion portion of it. That was pretty short. So, yes, exactly, which leaves more time for your questions. Um, so I'm waiting for questions to come through. Do any of you want to be the first person to ask a question? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Sure, Jonathan. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm actually from Montana. I had a question for you. You mentioned uh, the, the party not being sufficient. Um, and could you detail what other aspects need to be in place um, for a candidate to win? It sounded like you were talking about other groups or entities. Well, very few people, <coughs> even those who call themselves serious, committed conservatives, um, are as conservative as others who have that same characteristic. People seldom agree on everything. And the way you put together a winning coalition is to organize groups that are nonpartisan but are active in the public policy process and, and use those groups to identify very large numbers of people who share the conservative viewpoint on that particular cluster of related issues. If you build a mass base of that organization, then in, in an election period, the organization which is filled with people who agree with its mission can be activated in behalf of candidates who are solid on that issue. People trust the leadership of a public policy organization that shares their views and is fighting to implement their, uh, their principles in the public policy process. And uh, not everybody who is for the right to keep and bear arms is, is fully committed and exercised about the right to life. Um, but conservative candidates generally are in favor of the right to keep and bear arms, and they believe that abortion is the killing of an innocent human life. Um, but not everybody agrees. So it's appropriate then for uh, an organization that's formed around one cluster of issues goes to the people who are most enthusiastic about that organization and says, um, your group, which agrees with you and we're doing work for you, they say, we suggest very strongly that you get out and be active for such and such a candidate. A group focused on another issue 
which has its own mass base, can communicate a similar message focusing on their issue to the very people who are most enthusiastic. Now, a party can't do that. A party has to have people in it who have a great variety of views. You can have a party platform, and a candidate can be very specific about the issue clusters, but you're never going to put together a uh, a political electoral majority where everybody who votes the way you want them to agrees on everything. So a cluster of, of other organizations, each one of which is led by a move, hopefully by a movement oriented uh, person, uh, can all working with their own networks dramatically increase the number and the effectiveness of the activists in the general public who are working to elect a particular candidate. Political party can't do that because we all have been disappointed by people in any political party who, uh, for one reason or another, haven't performed as we would like them to perform. But uh, the party uh, is the legal vehicle through which things work. And there are a lot of people who whose principal political identification is not with any outside interest group, and people, for various reasons, consider themselves a member of a party. Um, they may be a member of the party because their family has always been members of that party. They may be a member of a political party because the uh, other political party is a minor uh, political factor, and they want to be in the party that is the major p political factor. Um, but people can be, uh, consider themselves uh, members of a party just because they happen to like, in general, the candidates that that party uh, nominates for office. Great. Uh, we do have a question from one of our viewers at home. Uh, Carolyn Connor would like to know, she is a small committee chairwoman, um, and she's needing to rebuild a depleted and elderly volunteer base. What one or two things would you suggest she do? <coughs> A depleted and elderly uh, base. Well, volunteer base. Volunteer base. Uh, when I got started in politics many years ago in the Goldwater movement, I uh, was Barry Goldwater's youngest elected delegate to the National Convention in San Francisco in 1964. I was 24 years old, and I was the youngest elected Goldwater delegate. Um, in those days, there was a general presumption that in order to be a member of a local party committee, much less be a delegate to the National Convention, you had to have gray hair or none. And there wasn't much of uh, an opportunity for young people to rise. And, and so at age 24, I was the youngest delegate. Um, that has changed dramatically. There, the parties are now much more welcoming to young people. Every four years at the Republican National Convention, there are a number of delegates who were elected at age 17. If they're going to turn 18 before the November election, they're eligible to be elected delegates. So the parties now are more welcoming to young people uh, th than, they, than they used to be. Um, so one of the important things to do is try to assist in the formation of Republican auxiliary groups. Um, there, there's always opportunities to start additional women's Republican clubs. And you can find a charismatic, effective, hardworking uh, person or a group of people to start a new women's Republican club. Or a young Republican club, which is generally for people in their 20s and 30s. And it's very easy to organize a college Republican club at any nearby campus. A certain percentage of the people who walk past a recruitment table are going to consider themselves members of a particular political party. And that is true even at left-wing campuses. I mean, there have been very strong conservative student groups, college Republican groups, and there's a wide range now of independent conservative groups that are nonpartisan, that are focused on specific issues, or groups that found just a campus conservative club. You can encourage uh, that. There are a dozen uh, or so 
national organizations that have campus chapters. Uh, the Leadership Institute has a very active field program where we send out field representatives. Uh, last August, we sent out 30 trained field representatives to visit campuses all over the United States to identify students and help them organize independent conservative student groups of whatever type they wished. Um, and so you get the students who are primarily concerned about free market economics, they can form a free market economics group. You get students who are pro-life, you get students who are for uh, the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, you can have a wide range of student organizations that are focused on conservative principles and find those people, get them involved. Um, uh, teenage Republican clubs are a wonderful thing. The problem with the Teenage Republican Club is that it requires at minimum one adult, maybe the parent of a high school student who will become uh, an adult advisor to the club and ordinarily it requires to having it in the high school some teacher who is willing to serve as a faculty advisor so the group could be uh, organized. So uh, there, there are many ways to do it, but you have to go out and ask people. You can't uh, sit around in a small meeting of elderly people and say, we have to do something to, to get, our, get the younger people uh, involved. You've got to go out and do it. You've got to find people uh, and, and encourage them encourage them to be trained on how to be more effective. I mean, there's so many individual little pieces of philosophically neutral technologies which would work as well for either party. I mean, how you work a recruitment table um, is uh, really quite simple, but people who do it instinctively uh, without studying how to do it are very likely to set up a card table and sit behind the card table to recruit people. Wrong. They, what they need to do is set up the card table, put the literature out for the organization, then stand in front of the table and as people walk by, talk to them. And uh, if you're standing up there and somebody is walking by, uh, they're likely to, to converse with you. Um, whereas if you were sitting behind a table, you you're separated from it, and you're not going to be as successful. You can sign up three or four times as many people just by standing in front of a recruitment table as you can if you're sitting behind a recruitment table. So I, I, I mentioned that you have to study how to win. Uh, the Leadership Institute offers now, I think, 47 different types of training schools to teach people how to, to organize and communicate and be effective in the public policy process. Study how to win. There's no sense in your learning by trial and error. That's the school of hard knocks, where you have to make every mistake until you learn the lesson. No. Uh, study things that are known and the trainings available to you. Very good. Any more questions from our audience? Sure. Um, my name is Marisa. I'm from Mississippi. And so I know that. Uh, we've been taught in our lessons that one of the ways that conservatives struggle with connecting with people is that we show our brains and not our hearts so they feel like we're not empathetic. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the younger generations feel like conservatives don't care, they're just concerned about the dollars or the data and not them as an individual. What advice would you have for us to be able to connect with people and show our passion through our hearts? Well, the, the left. <clears throat> both the politicians who are active in the left uh, as, as well as the news media uh, have an interest in portraying conservatives as cold-hearted, uh, angry, mean, unsympathetic people. And that isn't true. I mean, anybody who's uh, active in a church anywhere knows that many of the people in that church who are very conservative are among the finest, nicest people that you would ever have any opportunity uh, to meet. Um, there are good examples. I mean, Ronald Reagan, um, I worked for him on his White House staff for the first three years of the Reagan administration. A magnificent experience, and I had known him for a long time. I started supporting him for president 
and was an alternate delegate for Reagan to the 1968 Republican National Convention, and then an alternate delegate in 1976 when he ran for the nomination against President Ford, and in 80 I was in charge of the national youth effort uh, and then worked on his, his staff. Reagan had the quality that I uh, mentioned in my uh, remarks, the remarkable ability to say unpleasant things pleasantly. Um, Reagan had a, a spectacular skill in that regard, and I, I can't say whether or not that was just instinctive with him or it was cultivated by him, but it was there all the time. Uh, for three years, I was a special assistant to the president, and I organized innumerable meetings uh, with the president, with all manner of groups, including groups that weren't necessarily friendly to Reagan. And Reagan was a master uh, at giving the soft answer that turneth away wrath. I mean, he would set people at, at their ease. Um, and it's, it, it, if one happens to have a somewhat abrasive policy, uh, um, uh, personality, you can, uh, you can recognize that and, and start behaving differently till it becomes instinctive. Uh, and so I have no doubt that conservatives are much nicer people than the left. Um, but that is not what uh, the major news media say. That's certainly not what uh, people on the left uh, say. But it's true. Uh, and we have to realize that whatever we do, people are going to say that our motives are wrong and our tactics are uh, reprehensible. Um, but we have to continue to do and say the right things. And uh, I think Reagan's great skill was the ability to say unpleasant things pleasantly. I've seen angry uh, people attempting to embarrass uh, Reagan come up and ask a question in a meeting, and invariably, um, I, without, a, without exception, he was able uh, to come out of that with everybody realizing what a really good person, what a big heart he had, and how he really cared about people. Any other questions from our audience? Yes, from back there. Hi, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm from North Carolina. And what do you believe is the best way to handle tension and division within your party? The question is, what's the best way to handle tension and division within the party? Well, uh, in order to have a successful party, you have to cultivate some uh, awareness and sense of party loyalty. Uh, and people will tolerate others who disagree with them if they know that they share with some other person a, a party loyalty. Um, now, John Kennedy once famously said, sometimes party loyalty demands too much, and I suppose that could, could be true. But the, if you are active in a party, if you are a member of a party committee, if you are a party nominee for public office, if you are an, an elected uh, a government official, uh, you have, I believe, certain obligations for party loyalty. And that means that if you want somebody nominated and somebody else whom you don't want nominated wins the nomination, you have an obligation as a member of a party committee, as a nominee, as an elected official of that party, you have an obligation uh, to be supportive of that candidate. That doesn't mean you have to spend all day and all night working for this candidate with, who, with whom you disagree, but I think party loyalty does demand that you don't go out and attack the party nominee. Uh, and parties have a certain self-disciplining among this. If somebody who uh, gets angry because he didn't win a party nomination 
and then goes out attacking the nominee who beat him, uh, that person has pretty well burned his bridges because people who are active in the party are very unlikely to join together to try to nominate that person on some other occasion. So you have certain obligations uh, to do that. And, and, and that means sometimes you have to uh, um, not be as demonstrative as you might, might want to be. Back at the 1964 Republican National Convention, um, the Goldwater delegates were warned that when New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller came to speak, he, he was embittered. Goldwater had beaten him for the presidential nomination. They gave Rockefeller an opportunity to speak, and it was expected that he was going to try to draw an angry response from the crowd in the convention hall, and he taunted us. And we were told that no matter, we, no, no matter what he said, no matter how provocative he said, we should not rise up and yell against him or make obscene gestures, which he was noted to giving, uh, including at that convention. Um, we were to sit there with smiles on our face uh, rather than make what he was trying to do, that is to split the party and to prevent Goldwater from being elected rather, rather than helping to succeed. I will confess to you that as I sat there and was baited as a conservative activist by, by Rockefeller, I looked around at others, in the, I was in the Louisiana delegation, and all of us had been told, don't do anything provocative, don't rise to the bait. Rockefeller is going to try to make us responsible. So we sat there with smiles on our faces. But I learned then that it is possible to smile and boo at the same time. Boo! Boo! <laughs> uh, so, but if we were on camera, we didn't look like we were um, irresponsible, mean people. <laughs> Very good. Great question so far. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Uh, my name is Ethan. I'm from Hillsville, Virginia. And you say that you held a uh, position in politics at a young age. And I know a number of high school students who want to pursue politics as a career. And what would you tell a high school student? What, what can they do now beyond joining a conservative high school group? Uh, what standards should they live by? What, um, what steps should they take where they're out at right now to, to make it politically? Well, there's no doubt that it's difficult if you are uh, in schools that are dominated by uh, the major teachers union. It's difficult for you to come out um, as a principal conservative. The textbooks are left wing, the, the teachers are left wing. Uh, you're not going to hear the sorts of things that earlier generations had about how good America is. You're going to read in textbooks about how bad historically America has been. It's hard to have a love of country inculcated by the current educational system. Now, a lot of people, uh, including my son and daughter-in-law, working on this by homeschooling their kids. My uh, two grandkids, ages 8 and 10, uh, are being entirely educated at home, and they are reading the right things. But if you're in high school, you've got the uh, ability to do things on your own. And my suggestion is high school students would be well advised to systematically read some of the best books which discuss conservative principles, which they're never going to be assigned um, in, in, the, in their classes. And there are a lot of them. Uh, I have at the Leadership Institute website a booklet which is online called Read to Lead. And there I list 26 books which would be an important foundation for people who are inclined toward, con toward conservative principles and want to become more effective. There are 26 books. Some of them are um, um, uh, less intellectual, 
and, and communicate perhaps better to beginners than others. The one book that has had, I think, the most impact uh, of the books that I've distributed over time is a, a book by a, uh, a French journalist politician called Frederick, Frederick Bastiat. It's called The Law. It's a, uh, it's a relatively short book. It's brilliantly written. And he talks about uh, free market principles from a moral perspective. And it's very powerful, called The Law, Frederick Bastiat, B-A-S-T-I-A-T. But go to the, uh, your computer and just Google for Read to Lead, and I think that will take you right to the Leadership Institute website and that list of books, and I explain why these particular books are valuable. Great. Any more questions from our live audience? Sure. My name is Daniel. I'm from Loudoun County, Virginia. Um, you've been involved in the conservative movement for many years, um, I believe you said since the 1960s. Um, 1960 was some time ago. That's that right. was some time I, ago. I'm, that was. I'm still active. <laughs> uh, I'm age 76, and, I, um, and my parents and all four of my grandparents lived well beyond this age, so I think I chose my ancestors well. I hope to be active for a good while. We hope so, too. Um, with your involvement um, over the years, you've seen conservatives, the conservative movement, go through many different phases. What would you say, in your opinion, are some ways that conservatives need to adapt, change, or, or rethink something that, that we're currently doing today to be able to keep going strong in the future? Well, I don't believe that we have come anywhere near educating to effectiveness um, all of the conservatives who could be. Very few people are politically active. A whole lot of people don't even register to vote. Of those who, vo who register, many people don't vote. And of those who do vote, um, very few of them ever lift a finger to do anything other than vote. The vast majority of the American people have never contributed a nickel to a party committee or to a candidate. The vast majority of the uh, public have never set foot inside a party headquarters or a campaign uh, headquarters. The battle in the in in, the con in an, an election environment is, is not between everybody in one party and everybody in the other party. The, bat the actual battle, I believe, is, is between the effective activists on one side versus the effective activists on the other side. And the result is going to be determined by the number and the effectiveness of the activists on the respective sides. So we have an enormous opportunity. There are millions of conservatives who have never figured out the importance of political participation uh, in changing or forming the direction of, of public policy. So, so I mean, my, my Leadership Institute last year trained a little over 10,000 people. We've trained 100 and 71,000 people since I founded it in 1979. If there were 20 organizations as big as the Leadership Institute, we still would not be training anywhere near the total number who are available to be trained. But I think there's a, a greater opportunity now than, than there used to be. There's, there are things happening at the, uh, at the grassroots level um, which indicate to me Something is happening. I believe it is because more people than ever are really worried today that the country is going downhill and heading to disaster. Uh, I hear that all the time with people, more than I've ever heard it in my life. And this awareness that things are not going well for the country and there are impending dangers that really would be disastrous makes more people involved, uh, willing to become involved. And if they're willing to become involved, what you need to do is to teach them that they owe it to their philosophy to study how to win. 
Um, and there have been some absolutely remarkable things which have been happened spontaneously from the grassroots with nobody planning it and manipulating it from the top. We, we recently had in 2014 here in Virginia, uh, we had uh, an upset victory of a economics professor uh, 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 in a congressional primary against Eric Cantor, the majority leader in the U.S. House of Representatives. The result was probably the most stunning political primary upset in the history of American politics. That happened by people at the grassroots who were, who were unhappy, and they weren't satisfied with, with what was going on at the national level. They weren't satisfied with their incumbent quite remarkable, completely unplanned, virtually not predicted by anybody. Uh, we, we recently, in 2015, had a, uh, a, something of a revolt by hardcore conservative members of the House of Representatives in the Republican conference, which resulted in the overturning uh, and, the res and the resignation and retirement of the Speaker of the House. And this wasn't planned by anybody. The, the, re, the end result was not predicted by, by anybody, but there was a critical mass of uh, members of Congress who'd been elected by conservatives at the grassroots who decided that something had to be done. They set out to do something, and what they did was turn out the Speaker of the House. Some months earlier, if somebody had suggested that this was possible, people would have said, no, impossible. Uh, at, the, at the current time, we've got a large number of candidates for the Republican nomination for president. Um, we've had large numbers before, never quite as, as many, but uh, the pattern now is very different from it, what it used to be. It used to be uh, the establishment Republicans would coalesce around a particular candidate. Conservatives would be split among a number of other candidates. The candidate of the establishment would d develop a plurality, and then the wind psychology of people who, who's, who are strongly motivated by wanting to be on the winning side no matter what, the, uh, they would join that person, the establishment person got nominated. That is not the case in the 2016 presidential nomination. If you, if you add up the current poll numbers or the poll numbers any time for many, many months, you add up the total percentages of the people recognized as establishment candidates, and you add up then the total poll numbers of all the candidates who are, who are understood to be anti-establishment and conservative and appealing to the grassroots, the overwhelming majority of the people have decided they want to support one of these anti-establishment people. And that wasn't planned from the above. Individual people are out there now supporting a variety of, of uh, uh, anti-establishment candidates. And uh, uh, it's yet to be seen what's going to happen, uh, but it's certainly possible that the anti-establishment people are going to uh, see the imperative to unite, um, and, and that's enormously remarkable. And it wasn't planned from above. This is a result of what is happening <clears throat> at the grassroots. And there are other ind indications that, that I could give you of things that, uh, that are like this, like the, the victory of a grassroots Tea Party type conservative um, Matt Bevan, who was elected governor of Kentucky in, in November. Astonishing. Polls didn't predict it. Grassroots activism produced uh, a, 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 a surprising result. Uh, so I think it's possible that 2016 could be another wave election for conservatives. Conservatives have got to get around this problem of settling on somebody to be the, the the uh, conservative uh, unified candidate, but if, if they do that, 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 could, that could be another wave election like 1980 was. That was a wonderful moment uh, for those of us who'd been active for Reagan for a long time when we won that election, but that wasn't all there was. Most of you are too young to, 
to, to remember that, but that was one thrilling night. We learned early on that Reagan not only was going to win, but he was going to win at a landslide. But we didn't go to bed. We sat there in front of the TV station, in front of the TV sets, because <clears throat> every hour or so there was the announcement of some other conservative Republican who had defeated some longtime uh, liberal icon, and they just boom, 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 and, and uh, Reagan not only had a Republican majority in the Senate, uh, which was a surprise, but he had a substantial majority of Republicans. That hadn't happened in a long time. I was at the time on the U.S. Senate staff in 1979-1980, and uh, Democrats had had control uh, in, in the lifetimes, uh, in the one since the, the many, many years. And they treated Republican uh, senators and Republican staffers uh, as beneath contempt. And it was very difficult to get the functions of the official functioning of the uh, support bodies on the Senate staff to do the job for the Republicans that they were supposed to do. They were Democrats and they just w wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. That was highly satisfying. The, the, the next morning, uh, Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina was, uh, who by virtue of the fact that Republicans were going to become a majority and th therefore he, to everybody's surprise, was going to be the new chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, very important committee. Uh, Senator Thurmond had uh, been on the receiving end of a lot of treatment that wasn't really nice by the Democrat majority. So the next day he called in all the majority staff of the Senate Judiciary Committee and he said, I called y'all in here today to thank you for your service and to tell you, y'all fired. <laughs> A great moment. <laughs> um, we have time for one or two more questions. Um, any other from the live audience, or we can go to our at-home audience. Sure. I had a question um, following up on the earlier question that was asked about, and you touched on grassroots. Um, there's something I haven't heard you discuss today, and that is the Tea Party, and how you see that, the role that plays. Does it still play a role? And what are your thoughts as that developed and how that developed and where that, what effect that might have on American politics and particularly when it comes to the party system? Well, I think the Tea Party phenomenon uh, was important and valuable. And the Tea Parties still exist. They might not be as big as they once were, but they, they still do exist. This was another example of spontaneous activity. When the Tea Parties began, there were several national Tea Party organizations founded by different leaders. And quite frankly, these organizations were rivals to each other. They didn't like each other. And in fact, sometimes one group would sue another group. I mean, it was not real pleasant. Um, but what had happened was, People concluded that the country was in, heading in the wrong direction and felt an obligation to try to do something about it. And so the idea of Tea Party came up and anybody who wanted to could call themselves a local Tea Party and there were uh, a number of national organizations, uh, state organizations, local organizations. Often they were competing with each other. When the Tea Party phenomenon began. I knew the leaders of a couple of them, but the others were just people that had never been politically active before. Uh, and I decided that the Leadership Institute was going to be of service to these groups. And even though the groups didn't like each other, my staff and I approached as many different Tea Party leadership groups as we could, and we offered to do co-sponsored training with them. So in short order, we were doing national training programs co-sponsored by Tea Party Patriots, Tea Party Express, Tea Party Nation, state Tea Party organizations, uh, municipal uh, Tea Party organizations. We trained thousands of people 
who were well motivated and were and understood that they owed it their, to their philosophy how to, to study how to win. And we trained a lot of them. And, uh, and they went out and worked for candidates of their choice. And it was wonderful. But this isn't the only time that a whole influx of new people into political activity have um, come in for conservative purposes. I was part of the Goldwater movement, which was a grassroots movement. We were fighting against the an Eastern establishment uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, party leadership. Um, and a whole lot of us came in, and to people's surprise and to the left's horror, we nominated Barry Goldwater. Um, Ronald Reagan was the beneficiary um, of a lot of new conservative organizations which had sprung up, deliberately formed during the uh, 1970s. Uh, towards the end of the 1970s, suddenly a number of major religious leaders, some of whom had big television uh, um, programs, syndicated programs, networks, um, they began to activate previously inactive, uh, theologically conservative Christians. Up until that time, I can assure you that most theologically conservative religious leaders thought it was no part of their calling to be involved in any way in politics. And uh, suddenly it started with Jerry Falwell, who started the Moral Majority, and a number of other people who had major organizations. Suddenly they were contacting pastors, organizing voter registration drives in congregations of which in some cases not 20 percent of the congregants were, who were eligible had in fact registered, much, much less voted. And suddenly that group which was called the religious right in the late 1970s was involving millions of people who had never been involved before. When uh, the Tea Party came along, it was another phenomenon. More recently, there's been the phenomenon of the libertarians. A lot of the people who uh, got involved in the Ron Paul campaign, um, again, it was a new wave of, of activists. They uh, got involved uh, mostly in the Republican Party. And, you know, it's an interesting pattern here. I remember when we ha began the grassroots activity for, for Barry Goldwater, people said that these Goldwater conservatives, why, they're racists. They're mean people. They're a danger to uh, the, a peaceful uh, a political environment in this country. And you know what happened when the religious right began to send lots of people and they said, no, these people are racist, they're dangerous, they're, they're uh, the great unwashed people, they're, 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 it will be, be terrible. And you know what they said when the Tea Party began to, to put large numbers of people into the public policy process? They said, these, oh, these people are awful, they're racist, they're, they're, um, care, they're, uh, they're beyond the, the fringe. And you know what happened in every case? A lot of those people who got involved in these waves of new people coming in essentially to support conservative and free market principles, um, a lot of them are still involved. I, mean, I got involved in the Goldwater campaign and I'm still sitting here in 2016 as an activist, and a lot, and a lot of the people who for Goldwater are passed on, but a lot of people are still here, and a lot of people who were brought in in the 1970s with the growth of large mass-based conservative organizations, including theologically conservative uh, religious organizations, a lot of them were involved, and a lot of the Tea Party people are still involved. This is a cumulative process. We have to be able to welcome other people, and and frankly, we. Uh, we can't insist that everybody um, uh, 
take actions for the same motivations that activate us. Anybody who says it's not enough um, that you agree with me on every public policy question, if you don't agree for the same reasons, then to heck with you. Wrong. You're not going to build a majority that way. Let the left hope would hope that that is how conservatives uh, behave. Great. Well, Morton, unfortunately, we have reached our one hour mark. So that is all the time we'll have for questions today. Um, thank you for joining us today. We have set the bar very high for 2016 and the exciting webinars yet to come this year. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Great. And thank you all for tuning in today and our in-studio audience for joining us. Um, this was an exciting uh, webinar, which has been recorded, as always, and will be uh, put online for viewing later at leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand. If you're interested in um, the topic of today, which is people, parties, and power. It is also online, and you can find that on the writing section of our website where we have posted a number of writings. Um, so if you'd like to find that, you can go to leadershipinstitute.org uh, and then click on the writings tab. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to um, remind you to stay tuned for our next webinar. Um, the details of that are, will be coming up um, shortly, so watch your inboxes for that. And thank you all for joining us. Have a good night.